clearly there are usually you know established protocols on how you deal with asbestos within schools and and particularly seeking to address any question of disturbing it um so because there are many schools not just in kent across the country where asbestos is present and the usual advice is that you need to monitor it but ensure that it is not disturbed and clearly if any works uh, take place then that's got to be uh, a very important factor and i suppose that uh, ensures that you again you'd wish to ensure that the works are taking taking place in a way that is not um uh you know that, that does not cut any corners not that i think either schools or councils would do so so first of all take us back to 2018 and tell us what happened at single well primary well, at Single World Primary, there was, as you say, a collapse of a ceiling in, I think it was the staff room. Fortunately, it happened at a weekend uh, and that did trigger. In fact, if you look at the uh, National Audit Office and their account of what's happened uh, on the issue of Iraq over the last few years, that is what triggered uh, overall this becoming a national issue. Government had back in the, I think, 1990s first identified Iraq as potentially an issue, but it certainly became one. Uh, after that. And that uh, triggered, as you say, a great deal of work on our part in Kent, but also actually this was the start of it being taken up as a national issue. And from that, we saw uh, DfE issuing guidance and then ultimately the survey, which was uh, taking place from last year. And before that roof collapse, was there knowledge of rack at the school? Was there any kind of warning or was this a complete bolt out of the blue? To the best of my knowledge, and I was actually the portfolio holder within Kent on education at the time, it was a, it was it was pretty much a bolt from the blue. Certainly, there was no specific uh, warning any time, any great time in advance of that uh, of the situation at that school, and that triggered, as we as we've said, a great deal of investigation as to what the situation was with RAC. Uh, as I say, certainly we did a lot locally, but also it started. The national process. And as a result of that work that you did locally, is it right that you don't have any new schools impacted now in this latest announcement from the government? As far as we are aware, I mean, what um, it, on one of the lists I've seen, there's a reference to one particular school, but it's in the one that we knew about. And it's worth saying that there was uh, some further work done earlier this year, actually, in the, uh, back in the summer, uh, when there were some changes in guidance from the uh, Institute of Structural Engineers, or, which led to a number of, very, of closures. Uh, there were some seven schools within Kent that were affected. Uh, but in that case, we worked with schools uh, and bringing in some of the measures you were talking about. So things like uh, marquees, mobiles, uh, use of other parts of the school, or in some cases, uh, cooperation with other local schools. And that was done very, very quickly. Uh, really over not much more than a weekend to try to respond to that situation uh, and ensure that the schools were able to keep teaching until the end of the summer term and then work to be undertaken in many cases over the summer break. Uh, but as I say, we're in a peculiar situation because of our history in Kent. Uh, but what we have seen, I think, recently is that there's then been a further national change which relates, as I understand it, to uh, what's been discovered with other buildings or um, non-school buildings, actually, which has then triggered this advice from the Department for Education. Well, before we talk about other non-school buildings, uh, there's some discussion that children could potentially be in these porter cabins or temporary classrooms for up to a decade. In light of you being several steps ahead in Kent, of those seven schools that you've identified, do you know how quickly the, the, the buildings will be rectified and the pupils can be back in those schools, in all the buildings? Well, I, in, in, in pretty well all those cases, um, they're either the repairs were carried out over the summer or they are very close to being completed. So um, I, I can't answer for each and every situation at schools across the country, uh, but it is certainly the case that... Uh, uh, we wouldn't be looking at something involving a decade, uh, anything that I'm aware of. Well, that's it's worth saying. Also, so yeah, it's worth saying also, of course, that the work we do is particularly, and local authorities do generally, is in relation clearly to maintained schools, uh, to schools which are community or voluntary controlled schools. That said, actually in Kent, we've worked with academies and other uh, non-KCC maintained schools in seeking to address the problem. But it could be that across the country as a whole, uh, the surveys, as I say, have not all necessarily been uh, completed or certainly not all actions followed through from them. 
So there's clearly a process that's going to go on of finding out more in relation uh, to uh, uh, what's going on across all the schools estate. Mm. Although that said, I don't think so. I think some of the more sensationalist headlines that have been in this morning's papers uh, are almost certainly, certainly on the basis of our experience, uh, much exaggerated. And do you know about other public buildings? If we're talking about, you know, council buildings, libraries, hospitals, courts, do you have a sense of that in Kent? Um, I think it, I think it's relatively early days on that, but it's certainly something that there is awareness of. I think across not just Kent, but the whole public estate, that there is an issue there to be addressed. Now, as I say, what we've seen is that uh, in the case of uh, schools, when we've looked into those, including those that were, as we identified, at the highest risk, particularly those built between, say, 1950 and 1980, and to some extent into the 90s, but uh, 1980 in particular, uh, then in most cases, when investigated, it's turned out that there was not an immediate problem. Uh, but clearly there is a, a challenge across the whole public estate, which we need to look at. Mm. And what's the communication been like from government to councils, would you say? I'm not just talking uh, to you as, as leader of Kent County Council, but in your role of, uh, of speaking to other local authorities and other county councils, what's the general feeling? I think the feeling is that we would like uh, more of it. I think there has been a focus by the department on um, uh, upon seeking to work through schools and that particularly parents should hear first from their school. And I think we would all respect that. That said, councils are the responsible body for, as I say, community and voluntary controlled schools. And what's more, um, will be involved in many of the attempts at solution uh, across the entire school's estate. Uh, so I think the strongly held view from councils is that we would expect to see very, very short, in fact, would expect to see by now, certainly more direct communication, because we believe that we can be part of the solution. And when you're talking about solutions across the country, clearly in Kent at the moment, you're not having to deal with any new schools that are facing this issue. But for lots of head teachers and, and head of years and teachers, this is a nightmare this weekend in England. The kids are meant to be going back tomorrow, maybe Tuesday. And actually, they're trying to scrabble around for porter cabins or empty office buildings. What's the sense you're getting of how easy it is for head teachers to source this extra classroom space? Well, I think they are they are clearly seeking to respond to it as quickly as they can. But uh, I think everyone would agree that the timing of this, for whatever reason, uh, is uh, is about as difficult as it could be. Uh, so clearly, there is going to be a great deal of work going on. As I say, in our own experience, um, when we did deal with things at short notice, uh, we were able to work together effectively and deliver what were workable solutions across the schools uh, involved. But you know, it will vary very much from area to area. It will depend on how many schools are affected in an area. Uh, and, and equally, it will be something that will, as I say, depend very much also on the capacity of local uh, organisations, whether it's councils, whether it's academy trusts and so on, to be able to respond to it. So mm. certainly the timing is extremely difficult. I also want to ask you about a story on the front page of the Sunday Times today. It's revealing there are concerns that many of the buildings containing rack also have asbestos in them. And I know that you had to deal with asbestos in schools. As of 2020, 325 schools in Kent were recorded as containing asbestos. And I, I know you spent hundreds of thousands of pounds in settlements. How big a concern is this for councils that not only when rack is discovered, actually it could disturb asbestos? Clearly, there are usually you know, established protocols on how you deal with asbestos within schools and, and particularly seeking to address any question of disturbing it. Um, so because there are many schools, not just in Kent, across the country, where asbestos is present and the usual advice is that you need to monitor it but ensure that it is not disturbed. And clearly, if any works uh, take place, then that's got to be uh, a very important factor, and I suppose that uh, ensures that, you, again, you'd wish to ensure that the works are take, taking place in a way that is not, um, uh, you know, that, that does not cut any corners, not that I think either schools or councils would do so. Thank you so much for watching. You get extra points for making it all the way to the end of the video. And if you want to see more from me, Chloe and Callum, you can join us every Friday to Sunday on Times Radio from 6am.